Amen. Amen. Thank you, Paul. It's good to see you guys this morning. It's good to be here. Thanks for joining us here today. Thanks for those of you who are joining us online. We are excited to worship our God today, right? Are you excited? <laughs> yes? Thank you. There we go. So as we get ready to jump in, I want to encourage you to sing. Sometimes it can be really easy to just, especially when we've got these things on our faces, to just kind of tap out and stand and listen, but you cannot own the worship of the person next to you. So I encourage you to sing out. We've got the words, and we're going to be singing together as a church family, whether you're at home or here with us today. Let's sing together. Here we go.
God's word taught and we're singing it together. Let's read it together or listen to me read this psalm, but I invite you to join with me in reading this. Let's read. You, Lord, showed favor to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people and covered all their sins. You set aside all your wrath and turned from your fierce anger. Restore us again, God our Savior, and put away your displeasure toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger through all generations? Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your unfailing love, Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will listen to what the Lord God says. He promises peace to his people, his faithful servants, but let them not turn to folly. Surely his salvation is near those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs forth from the earth and righteousness looks down from heaven. The Lord will indeed give what is good and our land will yield its harvest. Righteousness goes before him and prepares the way for his steps.
worship you, God. We declare your holiness today. We declare your goodness today, God. We believe. We are grateful, Lord. You are good. You are good. Let's sing together. Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, He is my song. Let the King of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, He is my song, cause you are good.
check one. Sorry about that, guys. I apologize so much. Uh, I don't know if you heard, and if, you, if you're online, you might not have heard that, but I was just saying that uh, when uh, throughout this past week, I would guess that uh, you let someone down and someone might have let you down. Like, that's the, we're good at that, right? We disappoint one another, and it's just because we're imperfect, we, and that's just the way it is. But the, the, the great truth of what we just sang, that, that we serve a God who never lets us down, that we can always rely on, that he is always good. It's such a powerful reality, isn't it? Let's pray together, okay? Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for uh, just the privilege it is by your invitation of grace to trust in you. We thank you for the incredible offer that we have of salvation in your son. We thank you, Lord, that where there is uncertainty and chaos, you bring stability and peace. We thank you for the fact that where there's division and strife, you bring, you bring unity, Lord, and you bring joy. We pray, God, that you would just help us uh, to lean more and more into you and that we could, Lord, uh, just live our lives as people who, um, who, who ad- admit and acknowledge our flaws, our shortcomings, our sin, our failures, and our inadequacies and allow you to fill us up, allow you to make us whole. Help us to resist the urge, Lord, to try to do that for ourselves because we can't, we'll fail. And so we pray for your grace. And we pray that we would be agents of that grace. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to worship you. And as we turn toward your word, be our teacher today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat, everyone. Quick little object lesson there of uh, failure and inadequacy and shortcomings as my microphone hung off the back of my sweater, right? Uh, And it just reminds us uh, always of how easy it is uh, to to see how how imperfect we are. So I apologize again for that that little uh, snarky transition there. Well, we have uh, been in the Gospel of John for the last several months. It's been good to, to dive into that Gospel and to, uh, to, to just see uh, how God is uh, speaking uh, through it and, and to us as we, as we study his word and as we learn more and more about the person of Jesus and his, his interactions. Uh, we, we turned the chapter from, uh, or turned the page from chapter 3 to chapter 4 a few weeks ago, and we saw that Jesus was headed from Judea to Galilee. He was going there because... According to what we learned in in chapter 3, verses like 25 and 26, there was a little bit of a conflict that arose among some of John the Baptist's disciples about ceremonial washing. And because of that, then, uh, there was was this interaction that that, that John's disciples had uh, with with, uh, this particular group of Jews. And that led actually to, at the beginning of chapter 4, we see that some Pharisees, some leaders in the Jewish uh, religion were were kind of, uh, con- uh, kind of raising this almost like a confrontation between John and Jesus and kind of like trying to incite uh, uh, rivalry between them. And so because of that, Jesus had decided that he's just going to, to leave there, leave Judea, and head to Galilee. Well, on his way to Galilee, we saw that he ended up going right through, th- through Samaria, ended up stopping at a well, and he had an interaction with a woman. A Samaritan woman had come to the well at that point, and she said to him in verse 7 that she, she uh, Jesus said to her in verse 7 that, that he wanted her to give him, give him a drink. Well, that, uh, that kind of surprised her. It shocked her a little bit that a Jew would be talking to her, especially a Jewish man. And, and so it led to this interaction between Jesus and this Samaritan woman. They, they talked about a lot of things. He, he, he mentioned to her that he, he had this source of a water of life or living water, and of course, she was very intrigued by that, that she could have water there where she would, that, that would be provided for her. She could, would never have to get thirsty again. And, uh, and he, she kind of like, asked him to, to provide that water uh, for her. Well, then he, he kind of flipped the script on her and asked her to, to go get her husband and come back. And they would talk some more. And, and, and she then admitted to Jesus that the man that she was with wasn't her husband. And uh, he, of course, knew that knew that she had five husbands and the one that she was with now wasn't her husband. 
in her uncomfortability, she again kind of, she changed the subject and tried to talk to him about worship, like what's the right place to worship? All of us Samaritans believe it's Mount Gerizim, and all you Jews say it's in Jerusalem, and, and uh, he, uh, again, kind of clarified that for her. It wasn't so much about the place, but it was about worshiping God and in spirit and in truth. And at the end of their conversation, she said, you know what? Well, I know that the Messiah is coming someday. And when he comes, he'll clear that all up for us. The Samaritans, as I told you, had this concept of a Messiah very close to the, to the strict Jewish Messiah, of something that they called the Taheb or the Restorer, one that would, would bring uh, everything back to right order. And Jesus said to her in verse 27, as, uh, as verse 26, excuse me, as they were wrapping up their conversation, that he was the one that she was uh, talking about, that the one that she was speaking to, that he was the Messiah. And just as that conversation was wrapping up, Jesus' disciples showed up. They arrived from their journey into, into town to buy food, and uh, they came back and that re- elicited a lot more reaction. The, the woman, she was, she was super excited. She left her, her, her pail there, her bucket there, and she went back into her town. She began to, to tell everybody about what this guy had done for her and had she had to- he, how he had told her everything that she had done. And she's like, she's also intrigued saying, you know, could this be the Messiah? And the, the, the disciples, they're, they're somewhat amazed and confused and kind of like they don't really know what to do. Here Jesus is, he, here he is talking with this woman and a Samaritan woman to boot. And so they're just like, hey, man, you should eat something. And he re- kind of reframes that conversation so they, to try to help them understand what, what his real food is. It's about spiritual food, not this, this earthly food. And, of course, then we saw the reaction of the Samaritans when the woman came and told them they were intrigued as well that perhaps he could be the Messiah and some of them believed because of what they told her which was pretty shocking that they would believe her testimony the testimony of a woman and the testimony of a woman like that in the ancient world but after after spending time with with Jesus they said in fact that they they no longer believed because of what they she had told them but in verse 42 they say we no longer believe because of what you have said since we have heard for ourselves and know that this really is the Savior of the world. That whole scene wraps up in 43 as we kind of head into today's passage by John telling us that after two days, he left there for Galilee. And I, I shared with you last week as well that for Jesus to stay there in that Samaritan town for two days with them, it would have been similar to somehow breaking the segregation laws that existed in the United States before the Civil Rights Act. It would, it would uh, amount to breaking the, the apartheid laws in, in South Africa in, in, 19, in the 1980s. And so Jesus, being this revolutionary that he was, stayed two, there, two days there with the Samaritans. But eventually, just as we learned at the beginning of chapter 4, he was uh, headed to Galilee. And that's where we're going to pick up the story today in chapter 4. Uh, verse 43, where it says that he entered into Galilee. And when he gets into Galilee, you might say that there's a bit of a mixed reaction to his arrival. At one level, there is rejection. Jesus is rejected. In verse 44, John goes on to say, Jesus himself had testified that a prophet had no honor in his own country. Now, if you want more detail of this rejection sort of uh, motif that, that happened, you can look at uh, Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 30, where Jesus is actually within Galilee, but not at the place where he's going to be in our story, but in, in, in Nazareth itself, where, where, he, where he grew up. And there we learn that Jesus, after he had shared in the synagogue, some of the people after what he had shared and the word that he had spoken and about himself, they're like, wait a second, isn't this uh, Mary and Joseph's son? Uh, and, and they kind of like, uh, kind of incited him a little bit. And so he kind of dug in deeper in that lecture that he was giving there in the synagogue. And, and at the end of it, they were, they were furious. And Jesus, of, of course, had quoted this, uh, this, made this quote about a prophet not having any honor in his own hometown. So that's probably a little bit of what uh, John is referring to when it says that at some level he was, 
he was rejected. When I'm saying at some level he was rejected, John is referring to this, this uh, testimony that Jesus had given him about a prophet having no honor in his own country or in his own, in his own backyard, in his own hometown. But in addition to, the, to Jesus at some level experiencing rejection, he also, according to the passage we're looking at, was very welcome. Says, speaking of Jesus and his, and his disciples, you can see there in verse 45, when they entered Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him because they had seen everything he did in Jerusalem during the festival, for they also had gone to the festival. Now, this is a reference back to chapter 2. If you remember, what was one of the main things that Jesus did at the festival in chapter 2? Well, one of those main things was he cleansed the temple, right? He, uh, he, he drove out the money changers. He drove out the people who were selling those sacrificial animals because of the exploitation on the people who were coming there to worship. And so there's also an implication that perhaps Jesus performed other miracles, according to verse 23 in chapter 2. And so they had witnessed all that. And so when Jesus is coming into town, his reputation precedes him. And they, in fact, according to what John says, many of them had experienced those same things because they had been at that festival too. So uh, there's this, again, a little bit of a mix. Uh, there's going to be some rejection of Jesus in, in this region and during this time, but there's also a real welcoming of him. So what happens? Verse 46, it says, Jesus went again to Cana of Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son was ill at Capernaum. Now, when Jesus is in Cana, Cana and, and, and uh, where, where, he's, where he's located now, Capernaum is about 20 miles away from Cana. And so there's this uh, reference of this, this royal official whose son was ill at, at Capernaum. And it's going to open us up into what our main focus on, on is going to be on today, which is basically a dad story. This dad story is about this royal official. Literally, it, the words mean it's, it's basilikos, which literally means... Uh, one of the king's men. It, it, it means of or be belonging to a king, befitting or worthy of a king, subject to a king, kingly, royal, regal. We're not sure if the guy was a Jew or a Gentile. We're not sure of his social standing. In fact, we're not even exactly sure what it means, like what level of standing he had in the king's court. And by the way, even using the word king is a little bit of a misnomer. So who does this guy serve? This guy serves a man by the name of Herod Antipas. Now, this isn't King Herod, okay? So King Herod is gone, and when King Herod died, King Herod basically split up his kingdom among three, uh, three sons, Archelaus, Philip, and Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas is the one that we're, that we're referring to here as, this, uh, as the one who is in this, this royal official, this unnamed royal official. He's serving in his court. But Herod isn't really a king. He's what's known as a tetrarch. A tetrarch is a ruler of one-fourth. Now, you say, well, wait a second. You only said there were only three guys. That's right. So Archelaus, it's been said, received half. Maybe he was a better leader. Maybe King Herod liked him better. I don't know what it was. Maybe he just, like, stole something from, the other, from his brothers. But Archelaus got about half of the kingdom, and Philip and Herod Antipas got about one-fourth each. So Herod Antipas is a tetrarch, and that's who this guy is serving. He's serving this man, Herod, uh, he's serving Herod Antipas at some level in his court. Could be a low-ranking official, could be a high-ranking official, could be a Jew, could be a Gentile. All we know is that he was a royal official in Herod's court. And he comes to Jesus because why? Well, what oftentimes motivates dads to action? They're experiencing distress, right? He comes to Jesus and he, it says this. He says, when, when this man, this royal official heard that Jesus had come from Judea into Galilee. He went to him, and he pleaded with him to come down and heal his son since he was about to die. We see that this dad is in distress. He traveled the 20 miles from Capernaum to Cana. He comes there, and he pleads with Jesus, our, trans our translation says, it's actually in the imperfect tense, so a good way to, to translate it would be he kept on pleading. He kept on begging. He kept on asking. The imperfect tense refers oftentimes to continuous action that's, ha that's happened in the past. So he is continuing to do this with Jesus. He he's continuing to ask him. Why? Because his son was about to die. 
oftentimes it's interesting that Jesus, in, in, in many ways in Jesus' ministry, he goes looking for particular things to do. And then there are other times where things find him, right? People find him. We have, we have instances of both. Just like in John chapter 2, and I'm going to share with you uh, about the, the, in the water and the wine miracle, how, how uh, in, 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 in that uh, passage, we learn that, that it wasn't Jesus' idea for this miracle to take place, but it was his mom's idea. Again, things seem to find him. So in his distress, this man comes to Jesus. His son is about to die. He makes that 20-mile, probably horse ride, probably not on foot, probably he's on horseback, makes that 20-mile horseback ride to go to Jesus because he's thinking, maybe he can do for me what I've heard he's been able to do for others. I heard he was able to change water into wine at this, at this wedding in this city. I heard what he did. Maybe he had heard what he had done at the temple when he had cleansed the temple and drove out the money changers and the, those who were selling the sacrificial animals. At some level, he knew enough about Jesus to say, maybe this guy can help me with my problem. So he comes to him in distress. And, and, and what follows is kind of a curious response, right? It's a little bit, uh, it's a, it's a, you would almost see it as a little bit less than compassionate. The word of the Lord to this guy is this. Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Now, it should kind of remind you of what happened when Jesus' mother come to him, came to him and said when they were in that same city, right, in Cana, at a wedding, she came to him and said, son, big problem, we're out of wine. And Jesus didn't say, okay, mom, I'll handle it. What did he say? He said, why do you involve me with this? My time has not yet come. So in both of these instances, it's a bit of a curious response. Now, we're not sure who Jesus is saying this to. Is he, is he saying it broadly to all the people in the world? Is he referring specifically to the Galileans, or is he actually speaking individually to this man? We're not sure. It's just Jesus says, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Now, when you see that word signs, it, look, it should look very familiar. It's one that John uses often. And as we were moving for, through those first three chapters, we talked a lot about how John uses this word signs. It's the Greek word simeon. It's something, it's a distinguishing mark. It's something that someone does that distinguishes them from everyone else. It's something that gives them an identity, a particular identity. What is the identity that John wants his readers to know about Jesus? That he is the Son of God. And so John uses these signs that Jesus does, just like the one that he did in the, in the temple, just like the one that he did when he uh, changed the water into wine. He uses these signs so to help people to understand who Jesus really is and that he is the Son of God. It also, Jesus also uses this word wonders, which is, is the Greek word teras. A teras is an amazing or an unusual thing. It's, it's actually a sign that something either momentous or calamitous is about to happen. We call that a portent. And so this, 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 these two words, it's interesting to note that the, I believe it's 16 times that the word teros is used in Scripture. It's always and only used when it's accompanied by the word simeon. So it's always signs and wonders, never just teros alone. So Jesus is saying, unless you guys will will see something that identifies me, unless you will see something amazing or unusual, you just will not believe. Now, do you remember what Jesus' mother did? Remember, he, she came to him back in the water and the wine miracle, uh, back in Cana a couple chapters earlier. Remember, when she came to Jesus, she told him about the problem. He said, why do you involve me? And she said, she was not dissuaded by his answer. <laughs> she went to the servants and said, hey, do whatever he tells you, and neither is this guy. So when he receives this word of the Lord, again, could have been a broad statement, could have been about the Galileans, could have been to him specifically, but this guy won't be dissuaded and he has resolve, right? He is resolved to do something about his son's problem. He is determined. He is diligent. He is not going to give up. He's not, that may be true, Jesus. That may be true, but you got to do something about my son. So he says to him, sir, come down before my boy dies. It's interesting. 
when he uses this word, um, we, we translate it in English just my boy. It's not the word for son. It's a little bit different word. It's actually could be best translated my little lad, my little guy. Now, sometimes, like when you talk about uh, or, uh, a son or a daughter or a grandson or a granddaughter, you call them your granddaughter, grandson, son, daughter, but sometimes you call them what? Your little pal, your, your, your little girl, your little guy. And that's what he's doing here. He's like, it's, it's, it, it can refer, it can be something that refers simply to diminutive in size, but more here, it's the context of it. It's, it's more of a tier of, term of endearment. This a father is saying, come on, man, this is my little dude. This is my little guy. He's about to die. You got to come down. And so he's resolved. I love how oftentimes in scripture when people begin to experience Jesus in various levels, even at times where they may be misguided in their motivation, they seem to have this great resolve for Jesus to do something for them. Sometimes it reminds me of this, of the scripture that, that speaks kind of like convicting into my heart when, when I hear things, scripture say things like, I don't have because I don't ask. Or maybe I don't have because I don't ask with persistence. I don't know. I think there's a little bit of a lesson to be learned here about the resolution that this dad had. had. He wasn't willing to allow the words of, of, of Jesus himself to stop him from pressing forward and saying, sir, come on. Do something about my guy. Do something about my little, my little boy. He's about to die. So look at that form there. Sir, come, the boy is going to die. And what does Jesus do? Jesus responds by saying, you go, your son will live. <laughs> the very contrast of all those things, right? Go, Jesus told him, your son will live. In fact, the better translation of that would be, your son lives. It's clear here, Jesus is not saying he's going to get better. Okay, that's the clarification that we want to make sure that you have here. Jesus isn't saying, oh, this is, this is going to clear up. Everything's going to be okay. It'll work out. It's not saying, that's not what Jesus is saying by the, by, the, by the grammar and the emphasis and the context. What Jesus is saying here is, your son lives now at my word. Right? Remember when the, the miracle with the water and the wine, all Jesus said, did was he told the servants to fill up the the jars with water, those ceremonial wash jars, fill them up with water, ladle in, take some of that water to the head waiter, and all of a sudden it was wine, right? Because simply he had spoken that, thought that literally in in that context into existence. And Jesus here speaks life to his son, not he's going to get better, don't worry about anything, but your son lives, the word of the Lord. So we, at the end of this interaction, after we see this distressed dad come, not only distressed, but resolved to do something about his son's unfortunate situation, we also, from John, as he writes this, this gives that was inspired by God to capture this story for us, we have a little bit of an insight into the man's faith journey. The man says, the, the man, it says, believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went home. That word, word, is the word logos. Again, a very commonly used word in the New Testament and especially by John. Here it's saying, and, and it's not necessarily that, Jesus, that uh, this man is embracing all that Jesus is at this point. And maybe that's, maybe that's the seed that Jesus had planted in his mind back in verse 48 when he said, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will not believe. And we're actually going to find out that that actually kind of comes true <laughs> at the end of the story. The man, it says here, simply means the belief, the word that Jesus spoke to him would mean uh, something akin to me saying, he took Jesus at his word. He took Jesus at his word and he went home. So at some level, he's beginning to believe that what, is, what Jesus has said has happened is going to happen. There's a starting point for his faith, right? He's begun to believe at some level in Jesus and the, what he's be, uh, begun to believe is that what Jesus has said is true. 
So on his way down, in verse 51, if we continue with the story, it says, while he was still going down, going back to Capernaum, his servants or his slaves met him, saying that his boy was alive, the very thing that Jesus said. At this point, we have another little insight into the man's faith journey. For some people, as they begin to, to consider what it would mean to follow Jesus, they have to do a little bit of investigation and confirmation. That that's exactly what this man does. He says to them, hey, what time did he get better? He asked them at what time he got better. And they say to him, yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. Now, there's an interesting thing here. The guy, I told you, he probably came on horseback, right? Let's just say that he didn't come on horseback. Let's say he came on foot. So uh, a quick walking pace is about four miles an hour, right? So let's, let's slow that down. Let's say it was like more like three miles an hour. That if, he, if he was walking, which he was probably not walking, he was probably on a horse. If he was three miles an hour to go 20, 20 miles, it would be a little less than seven, seven hours, right? So why is he not there till the next day? And there are a lot of things written about that. It's kind of like one of those curious little things in Scripture where you might read by it and you're like, huh, never thought about that. But yeah, why isn't he there that same day? Because if he was there at the, at the, at the, at the very time, if he was there at the time that the Scripture goes on to, to say, then he was there at the, in the afternoon of the previous day because look at what they say. So he asked them, what time did he get better? Yesterday at 1 in the afternoon the fever left him, the answer. And the father realized this was the very hour at which Jesus had told him, your son will live. So what happened from 1.15, let's just say that, 1.30 in the afternoon, all the way to the next day? Did the guy have so much confidence that he just stayed in, uh, stayed in Cana for a night? Did he have to go see some friends? Was he having to do some business for the, for the Tetrarch, Herod Antipas? Was his horse worn out and so he couldn't do another 20-mile ride back? Were his feet tired because he happened to be walking? Unlikely. Why was the guy not there till the next day? Who knows? But it's kind of like an interesting little question, right? But notice that what he's trying to figure out is, okay, did he just get better or was he made well? He asked them. And they say, you know, it was at one in the afternoon. And he realizes that's exactly when Jesus said that he was alive. Not that this thing is going to clear up. This fever, it, 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 our, our translation calls it a fever. It's a, it's a word that, that refers to lots of different physical ailments. And so uh, uh, the translators of the Christian Standard Bible just kind of pick fever. But it can refer to many ways in which one experiences, uh, experiences physical ailments. And it was then when the, when, the, when the fever left him. And it was at the very time that Jesus said his son would live. So he went from interest, right? At some level, he believed, in, he believed that what Jesus said was true. He did some investigation and confirmation on, on, uh, to, to make sure that it wasn't just coincidence that, his, that this guy said his son was going to be well, made well, and then he was well. No, it was at that very time, and it leads then to kind of like, not the conclusion, but that next step of his faith journey, where in 53, uh, the second part of 53, we see, and he... And his entire household believed in Jesus. Now, again, it's kind of like, well, why did they believe? Because they saw a sign and wonder. <laughs> why did they believe? Because Jesus said their son, that this guy's son would live, and he lived. And so he trusted in Jesus. But the word believed is, is the very word that Scripture always uses to what, what it means to have saving, saving faith. John's used it before in his gospel, Pistueo. It, it simply means to think something to be true, to be persuaded of something, to place your confidence in it. That is to have faith, to have faith in something, upon or with respect to a person or a thing, to believe. This man believed and his entire household believed in Jesus. It's the same kind of response that we see when uh, Paul and Silas are locked up in, the, in a jail in Philippi, and there's an earthquake that happens, and the doors come open, and the jailer, the guy who was working in the jail, wakes up, and he's afraid that everyone has taken off, and, and they calm him down, and he's like, man, alive. 
you know, after, after speaking with them and they, they kind of plant some spiritual seeds and he asked those, those two guys, what must I do to be saved? This is what his words. And the response from Paul and Silas are, they say to him, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the very same word, and you shall be saved and your house. Your house can be saved in that same way. And that's exactly what happens in this Philippian jailers, or in this uh, royal official's life. You might say, how does that apply to me? Well, let's think of why we believe. We believe because we have come, we have placed our trust in Jesus, because we have come to trust in the fact, to believe in the truth, that he is alive. The resurrection is the greatest sign and wonder that has ever been demonstrated in the history of the human race. We believe because Jesus is alive. The disciples would not recant because they were convinced that Jesus was raised from the dead. The New Testament is written with an emphasis on believing in Jesus because he is the one that conquered death and hell, right? He conquered the ultimate enemy. That is one one of Paul's theological emphases. And so for us, just like this man who encountered Jesus and came to him in distress, we might come to Jesus with different levels of distress in our own life. We need to understand how he can speak life to us. He doesn't say to us, go, things are going to improve over time. No, he says to us that if we come to him in faith, that he can make us well instantaneously. At his word, we can be made well from the sickness that we have from our own sin. And we can be made well because of that sign that he did, which was that he was able to conquer the grave. That's why we celebrate Easter. That's why we worship on Sunday, the first day of the week, because every time that we gather together, it's a reminder of the fact that we don't serve a God who is dead. We serve a God who is alive. And so we can put our faith in Jesus. We can do that same thing. We can think that to be true. We can be persuaded of the fact that it is true, that he is alive. And we can place our confidence in that. We can place our faith in that. And that can change our lives. Many of us sitting here today or watching online have already placed our confidence in that truth. But I pray that as you walk through life and as you deal with problems and as you see tragedy and you, and you walk through difficulty and all the different things that life has to throw at us, I pray that we would be reminded of that simple truth that our faith has been placed in one thing, the person of Jesus, in his sacrificial death and his resurrection. That taken together is what gives us life. If you believe in the Lord Jesus, you will be saved. We confess with our mouth that he is Lord and we believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, right? The very sign that Jesus did to end all signs, so to speak. We will be saved. Just like this royal official, just like that jailer in Philippi, just like many people sitting in here today, we can be saved. If you're sitting here, or if you're watching online, and you've never placed that ultimate trust, faith, and confidence, and belief in Jesus, I would invite you to do that today. As always, when I mention this, if if there are questions for those of you who are watching online that you might have about how to take that step of faith, uh, you can click on uh, on those links that are dropping into the chat so that that would take you out into a conversation with someone who'd love to talk to you more about what it means to have a relationship with Christ. And if you're here today, I'd invite you to consider receiving that very same offer, that offer of placing your faith, trust, confidence, hope, and belief in Jesus. Because in that, and in that only, there is life. And that life is a life that It's different than the way that the young little boy's life was restored. That life is one where we have eternal life. So this morning as we're wrapping up today, 
just before the worship team comes and leads us in a, a closing song, I'd like to lead us in a prayer. And if you would bow your heads with me, either here or at your homes, that'd be great. Heavenly Father, how we thank you for just showing us the life-giving power of your son. And God, Jesus' words are true. We needed a sign to believe. We need a sign to believe. And you've given us that sign. Jesus said the sign that we would receive would be the fact that basically he would be killed, he would be buried, but then he would be raised to life. I pray, Lord, that if we've already placed our trust in that, that we would walk daily with our ultimate confidence being in that truth. And if we've not let yet, Lord, we've not yet um, trusted in that truth completely, that we would yield our life over to you today. Admitting our need for you, confessing our status as one who is sinful and separated from you, confessing that you are Lord and believing in our heart that you raised your son from the dead. We know that, Lord, your word declares that we will be saved. Thank you, God, for the gift of your word and the gift of this particular portion of it. We pray that it would ring true in our hearts in the days and weeks to come, that we would walk more and more in reality of the life-giving power of the Lord Jesus himself. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Why don't you go ahead and stand? We're going to close our time today with a familiar song of, of worship and praise declaring God's sovereignty over all things, affirming yes, amen, let it be. We surrender ourselves and our lives to you, Lord, for your glory. Let's sing together.
pray together. Thank you, God, for the opportunity to lift our praise to you. We praise you for who you are, what you've done, and what you're doing today. We pray that you would help us to have deeper and greater faith in you. Help us to lean more into you, Lord, and walk according to your word and and embrace the community that you offer in the family of God. Fill us, Lord, with your Holy Spirit that we might be people who live as you would want us to live, as followers of Jesus. We pray, God, that in all those things and in ways beyond how we can ever ask or imagine, that you would receive all the glory, honor, and praise. Through Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week, everyone. We'll see you soon.